Facility Committee, the City of Tarpon Springs, this Thursday, February 17th at 6 p.m. I'd like to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Can we get a roll call, please? Sure. Chairperson Dory Larson. Present. Vice Chairperson Paul Robinson. Here. Member Taylor Mandalu. Here. Member Denise Menino. Here. Member Karen Gallagher. Here. Member Robin Sanger. Here. Member Carol Mickett. Here. Public Service Director Paul Smith. Here. And I'm here, Sustainability Coordinator. Thank you, Robin. All right, well, good to see everybody again. Apologies for missing last month, uh, my little COVID experience, and so now I'm immune as can, immune can be for, I guess, a couple months, hopefully, right? So, um, but thank you, Paul, for, for stepping in and for running the show. Um, so our first item on the agenda is the approval of our minutes from March of 2021. I don't know if anyone what, remembers what that far it? back, <laughs> but I don't know, but uh, I would like to entertain a motion to... I have a correction. Okay. Okay. In it, it refers to me as Mrs. Mickett. Um, that would be my mother. Um, so you can refer to me as Dr. Mickett or Ms. Mickett. And all of us, all the women are Mrs. So I think Robin was a Mrs. too, in her. Mrs. Sanger? No. Okay. Comments noted. <laughs> All right. Denise, are you a Mrs.? Do you mm -hmm. want to be a Mrs.? I go Ms. or Mrs., and those would both be okay. accurate, so it doesn't okay. bother me. We usually go just MS yeah. period to be yep, that's neutral. Fine. Yeah. So yep. let's so let's go ahead and note that uh, addition or modification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. With that, can someone motion to accept the minutes from March of two thousand one? To so. second. 2021? 2021, sorry. <laughs> and we have a second. And that, that motion yes. is with the changes to the titles? Yes. Excellent. With the amendments, yes. Perfect. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And if I may add something on that. So obviously we're catching up. Um, you'll see in the coming meetings we'll be having probably multiple uh, months as um, we're working it out with... Um, Robin and getting some other help to catch up. This was something our department took over and uh, we have all the records. It's just a matter of uh, getting it on paper and in front of you for final approval. So we'll be working on that as a priority. All right, so moving on to the next item, our follow-up. The first is from the Sustainability Committee and the staff team meeting uh, recap. Um, Thank you all for, for being at the meeting, for asking questions, and um, you know, obviously thanks to the staff for participating. I just wanted uh, a couple questions to follow up there. Um, how, what is the cadence of us meeting with the staff, with that staff group? Um, and how are we going to, how are they gonna incorporate the questions that we asked, and then how are we going to continue working with them? I'll start, Robin, and if you'd like to add any more to what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. first step is for Robin to compile all of that input, and she's already started on that, and um, put it together as far as a revised draft, start working on finalizing those tables in each section of the report. And as I mentioned before, I'm recommending that we bring those tables back in front of you for final approval as part of preparing the report. As far as future staff comments, questions, I would say that as the need arises, um, if there's a particular department head that you need to talk to about something, we can do that. Um, I don't know that I see another meeting like that anytime soon. I think we've got some other things to focus on in the coming months. Uh, community engagement really is what I'm talking about. So that's my answer for that. Robin, anything else? Um, 
Yes, I agree with that. And just as needed as we go throughout the process, kind of doing, I'm imagining regular checkpoints as we get through this comprehensive plan. Oh. Or, since, sorry, sustainability plan. <laughs> since you said that, Paul, um, I went back over that meeting um, recently. And it, again, it struck me as it did during the meeting that we got very thorough um, responses from public services, um, from the police, from the fire chief especially, from Tom Functions Department in, in the form of the very thorough uh, question and answer period and a lot of information that, that uh, Shannon Brewer and, and mm -hmm. you know, another member of her staff uh, shared with us. The one area where we didn't seem to be on the same page concerned economy and jobs. Um, both the written and the verbal responses um, from the Economic Development Department did not seem to be in sync with, with the questions we asked and with the things that we put in the sustainability plan. We might benefit from another meeting with them. Okay. Could you say what you didn't think was in sync? Yes. Um, well, there were several things, actually. Uh, Carol, and, and you kicked it off by asking a question about the uh, library program uh, that we were referred to and found out that, in fact, it had not been running and only recently got funding uh, from outside the city. And then I asked uh, questions about um, from the first area of um, e economy and jobs, the percentage uh, workforce in Turpin versus the rest of the country, and the representative could not answer that question. And then I asked a question about uh, specifically green jobs, and would they be included in the comprehensive mm -hmm. plan, and she didn't know. Um, and she then said, you know, we don't want to discourage green jobs. Well, mm -hmm. that's sort of the opposite of, of where we're going. So I think, you know, maybe we need to, to be more informative uh, going forward, but I think we need to meet with that department specifically. One thing I'd be interested is um, the arborist and the woman from the parks department talking about um, the possibility of an innovative way of putting trees down at the sponge docks. That was intriguing and um, they were so excited about it. And to me, that seems like a very important um, thing to follow up on. And I just would like to encourage that and find out more about it. And then um, I didn't, you know, obviously I wasn't there to be able to <laughs> ask questions or, or give input, but I did want to um, mention that in um, NS1, the Local Action 8, it's dedicated percentage of funding invested in green infrastructure, so I'd like to continue to advocate that ARPA funds be used for that. Um, that was also kind of, along those lines, um, I just wanted to call attention, um, there was uh, staff comments at the end of the slides that, that I don't think that we really discussed. I didn't see the, much of a discussion, because I did watch the, both the videos in real time. Um, uh, there was a comment about creating a sustainability fee, possibly attaching it to building permits um, to provide funding to go towards sustainability projects. And I, I really like, would like to continue discussing that um, recommendation. There was a staff recommendation uh, at future meetings. Um, yeah, those are, the, those are the two things that I really wanted to put a finer point on. And I agree with you, Paul, that um, I had written for a lot of the uh, economy jobs, the, a lot of the local actions I didn't think were addressed. Um, well, and, and I think going forward, if we want green jobs and the other things in that section of our plan to be incorporated in the comprehensive plan, we're going to need to work together on yeah. those. Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> okay. Um, let's, we have um, a point, really point busy of agenda. Preference. Point of personal preference. Okay. I can't get online. Uh, it's asking me for a, a password. Yeah, we have a new password. <laughs> okay. Did you write it down? Do you, do you remember it? Funders. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Funding? No, Spongers. Spongers. All lowercase. Sponger, one or two. 
plural or singular? Plural. Many, many spongers. Okay. Don't let that get around. Don't let that get anyone know that. <laughs> I was I'm sure it's not being recorded. I mean. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Right, it's such a secret password. Oh, yeah. oh Lottie. Okay, and then I also wanted just to call everybody's attention to the to the length of this meeting, <laughs> the the number of items on the agenda, yes, thank mm -hmm. you. and that okay. we have a presentation um, from Arcadis about the um, Wicken Bayou project. So, if we could mm -hmm. try to be mm -hmm. on point with uh, our comments and succinct, that would be awesome tonight. Okay, um, and then next. Uh, can we get a, a brief update then on the February 2nd, the comp plan board and committee? So some of us were there at that meeting um, over at SPC. And I guess my question is, um, like, how, how are we going to show up as a group for the next meeting? I know that there's going to be another meeting they mentioned, and I know that they had wanted to do kind of small group information gathering, but because of COVID, it was more just a free flow of ideas throughout the evening and was maybe monopolized by a couple of folks and maybe not everybody got their thoughts out. So can you tell us more about next opportunities for that? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, I'm really proud of our group. We had a great turnout, I think. And um, I do look forward for an opportunity for more sustainability to be discussed specifically. And I did mention that later with the planning and zoning staff after the meeting that and they said, oh, of course, we're, we're talking about how to do that. So it's on their radar. I'm going to leave it to them to figure out how that's going to happen. And, of course, we'll keep you in the loop on as it develops. Um, but I do think there's going to be an opportunity to talk more sustainability in, in detail. As you mentioned, that first meeting, they sort of shifted the strategy to make it more of a broad um, understanding of planning and zoning. And there was a lot of questions that were mostly related to zoning and planning and not so much in our area so um yeah look forward to the next meeting on that and um i know robin will be staying in touch and letting you all know as soon as she knows something more can't they come to our meeting i thought that they had come to the public art group from what i understand. Yeah, that might be the easiest way to do it and i do remember hearing that so um that's certainly a possibility Okay, so you guys are going to touch base with them and then get back to us on how how we can weigh in more effectively. Excellent. All right, next item then is consider approving sustainability logo, plan name, and flyer for public engagement. Robin, can you lead us off? Sure, and I can, um, I'll put the different logos and flyers on the screen and we can kind of go over them that way and um, do a vote on your favorites. Uh, and also approving the sustainability plan name, which there was a motion made last time, I believe by Karen, um, to vote at this meeting on sustainable Turpin Springs as the plan name in particular. So this here is logo option number one. This was made by our planning department. And it says sustainable Tarpon Springs at the bottom. She did want me to mention that she can make the text easier to read and, and that's very easy to do. Now for the second option. It is Essentially the same as the first, except with a thinner text at the bottom, just a slightly different text option. This is option number three. And um, I wanted to note that that sponge diver helmet is actually taken from the entryway signs of Tarpon Springs. So we thought since that has already received approval from the Board of Commissioners, that particular sponge helmet, that might be a easier way to get approval for this logo to kind of use what has already been designed by consultants for the city. So we took that original logo and put a sustainability spin on it. And logo option number four, 
Are there any that you would like me to revisit? Um, I really like the one that was um, in the last group we got last last month with the gold helmet and the green coming out. I like the green way better in this one, and I like the helmet better in this one. In this particular on the screen or in the previous meeting? The previous one. That logo was taken from Google, so there might be some copyright associated with it. Even with the green coming out of it? Yeah, that, that just logo from the last meeting in general was for more of visual purposes, but um, we can try to make it look more like that one. Yeah, I, I think that the green in this one is m much better. That looks like green fire. And I also, well, I don't like the words on this one. I like the words around there. But I really like that one. Which one? Right, I think I have that here. And you've got five different logos there. Helmet. You want the, the, the one right. on the right? Helmet, yeah. yeah. I think that. Um, I prefer number it. three, the yeah, one I that is slightly that. turned to the to the side. I think it's it's a very powerful image. Uh, that to me is 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 the best of the four. Which one's that? Number three, the one prior prior to this. Oh, that one. Oh, yeah. One. I also like the way the the um, tight um, and the birds tie in with the city logos. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could kind of do a hybrid of the one that Carol likes, only using the Lario sponge helmet, and that that should satisfy any copyright things with Google. Is that what you're talking about, the Lario helmet that you like, Paul? I, I don't understand. That like helmet was designed, it says the L Larios is the helmet maker. Yes. So the one Carol likes is, <clears throat> is more of a generic one, and you're going to put that up there? Um, I actually, I do not have that on the computer right now. Um, if you'd like, I can try to get it on the computer. But that, that particular image is a copyrighted, copyrighted image. That's that's good. But I you said like this one green. has been used by the city. This one up here is not copyrighted. This one is used by the city on the entryway signs. So um, they contracted, they had a contractor design the artwork for them. It went through a whole approval process. It's not copyrighted. Correct. We can right. Use this, this one is, That's my this purpose. one's for the city. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So consensus sounds like with uh, choice number three. And I think, guys, that we also, I mean, I know that we all want to give feedback, but like it's going to be impossible to get everyone right. really happy with the one thing. And whatever we select, the board of commissioners have to ultimately like okay it. And so if they're already using this that they've already okayed, to me it just oh, makes okay. sense that we need to just give Robin the the flexibility to this. You know, we've we've kind of given our input. This is what we want to. This is mm -hmm. you know, and let's let's let Robin go with uh, putting that together. Keep it easy. Keeping it, I mean, I won't dwell on this, but I think that, <clears throat> I think the seagrass in that looks really awkward, just kind of floating there. So if there's some way to make that look more natural going around the helmet, that would be helpful, but I'm good with this one too. Yes, this one was the best of my artistic abilities, but I will work with some more talented city staff to improve that. Yeah, I think that would be my thing, just Make the green not, you know, make it incorporate it with the helmet somewhat. Okay. Does that give you direction? Sure. Okay. So we like it in essence, but the seagrass more like that image from the previous meeting. Right. Correct. Can I, can I just ask on um, this, this being the logo, when it comes out <clears throat> actually as the sustainability um, uh, plan, that um, that I, I would love to see kind of how that whitewashed um, scenario behind that we've had on some of like the flyers, like in the backdrop mm -hmm. with that being very prevalent, this logo being very prevalent on the front. But if it's just on white like that, it makes, to me, it makes it look very uninviting. Yeah. Just as like, it's white and here's your logo. Okay. But some of the things that we've, pr we've seen before, I think, um, Paul, maybe you, you did the, fly the initial, one of the flyers we had where the backdrop 
to the mm. paper is just kind of like almost like a faded out cityscape, not cityscape, but like mm. the um, the mangroves, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a photograph, but it's so it's very faint. And then that just being very prominent on it, because I think just on white paper, it, it, to me, it makes it look like a, a very business document that's intimidating and I don't have any interest in reading it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very stark. Yeah. I love the logo. Um, you know, and, and, and I, the typeface on that one better than underneath, what have you. But I think if we're using it, <clears throat> you know, perfect as a logo, but if it's coming out on that actual sustainability action mm -hmm. plan, I'd love to see that. Often, you're, you're, you're objecting to a white background? That, that looks very um, mm -hmm. generic to me, just kind of a, it's just kind just of floating on there. It, it, this, this, okay, pretend the logo is this one, and here's the very front of your sustainability action plan that's going to be printed. Yeah, I don't like it. Right, so um, my thought is just a bit, <laughs> I don't. I, I mean, that's it's, on white too, and it's, it, and, and the white in the center of the helmet, it, but, lo it looks empty versus, you know, this has depth. And colors. She's right. just making a point yeah, about I, the I white just, background. Just the white background. So lo the logo, I know we're approving the logo. My thought process yeah. is just on the actual document. It'd be nice to have the background be one of those faded photographs of the mangroves yeah. or something mm. that gives it a little more depth on the paper. One mm. of the things is if it's going to be up on a letterhead, oftentimes, I've done this with logos, you put it in an oval with the background in it. Mm -hmm. So then that can be on white paper because the paper will probably be white. Right. So that makes the logo pop. Yeah. So you can experiment with that. <laughs> yeah. For the logo, I, I, that's my, yeah. my preference. I think that's a good observation. <laughs> There's a little aside. Though. I will say we would like to use this for our car wraps for the oh, EVs okay. and there may oh, be nice. white cars and, you know, not necessarily a giant one on the hood, mm -hmm. but um, maybe something this big around on the side. Mm-hmm. You know, along with the city logo. So, just want to warn you, there might be some white. No, no, no. You know, I'm, I'm specifically yeah, saying just on for our the report. actual plan, the actual report. Yeah. This looks very uninviting. I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's the cover. Yeah. 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 Every, everything else you can do whatever. You can experiment <laughs> okay. to see what background works best with that. You'll have to try a few. Sure, I can definitely do that. <laughs> All right. Next item is the plan name. So sounds like there was consensus to go with sustainable tarpon springs. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was unanimous. All right. So go ahead and go forward with that then. Um, and then the flyer for public engagement. Mm. <coughs> oh, sorry. Okay. No, I forgot. Where's the flyer? This is flyer option one, which I believe was submitted to the committee in essence previously, although we did change the wording to reflect that the survey is now available and this is how you take the survey. Okay. And this is flyer option two. one yes for now for the survey and then when we have the workshop finalized the dates and times we'll do a second flyer for that one this is much more readable than the first one could you flip back to the first one again please Robin okay. yeah I think the second one's much more readable Mm -hmm. I like the layout of this one, but it is difficult to see the small type. But I, the background is exactly what you might have been talking about for the sustainability. Yeah, just plan. like a very faded. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> Maybe that's where I came it's up really with that idea. <laughs> it wasn't mine. So 
So I, I like this one for <clears throat> um, just it gives you just that littlest bit more information. But there's a lot of there are a lot of words in there that I think don't necessarily need to um, be included. You know, like where it says we need your input, it would be easy enough to say to take the to take the survey visit to almost to leave that whole last bit out. Mm -hmm. You know, that just is to take the survey visit this or scan the QR code. So you yep. can almost lose leave it, lose that last paragraph. Yeah. And then even in that first paragraph, <clears throat> you know, just there, I think you could condense that. Just the littlest bit that says, you know, the Tarpon Springs Sustainability uh, Committee, um, it, along with city staff, are, you know, working to draft a sustainability plan. This plan will serve as a blueprint um, for moving forward, you know, with Tarpon Springs. And look, it's just a very you know, two lines worth of input, then we need your input to take the survey. So you can almost make it as short as the other mm -hmm. one. But this one actually gives you just that little bit of information that says we're working together to do this. And this is why. Like this is a blueprint to make Tarpon Springs more sustainable in the future. And to, to me, I like that little bit of more information than just please take our survey to, to help mm -hmm. guide, the, guide the department. I think it makes them feel more makes somebody feel more included but yes it's definitely possible to change the text okay so what I'm hearing is we like the image on the second flyer the flyer that looks like it's at Fred Howard Beach Karen you like the image on this one right uh, I, 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 to be fair, I'm indifferent to the image. Okay, gotcha. you know that that kind of fell to the wayside because I was more concerned with Content. having it be too verbose, but still the second one not having enough information. You could add more information to the second one. The reason I like the second one is the like the typeface on the first one where it says Tarpon Springs is hard to read, and this is strange, but I like this one because it looks like, you know, there's this beach with some, like we need sustainability because our beach is eroding a little or something's <laughs> happening to it. And so it says to me, we better get to work. So we need to do something. Um, it's partly why I like this one. So maybe we take this one, but we add the language in that you were wanting from the first that kind of explains a little bit more of like what we're doing with this. I, I, th I think they're both fine, so don't get me wrong. It's not, I, I just, if we're going over, um, that that was just my input for it. So I'm, I would I would be okay to either way. I, I don't have a, I'm not gonna go home and cry if I don't <laughs> get my way tonight. <laughs> uh, uh, no, that honestly, when I looked at the two of them, that one almost seemed a little disjointed to me. Hmm. Like having the Tarpon, city of Tarpon Springs in this corner, your QR uh -huh. code, and then you've got verbiage here, and you've got, it, it just seemed a little disjointed. And so as I was reading, I was like, well, gosh, the other one, if it was just condensed a little little bit and some of the verbiage was changed, you just have just enough information and mm -hmm. say, we really need your help, mm -hmm. you know, to participate in the survey. Mm -hmm. Well, can I ask is who, who likes the first image versus the second image just in terms of background I'm calling this number one right uh, this is the second one. Oh, the second one that's number um, one the birds first one is the mangroves just just for background first one sake. is the mangroves yeah yeah With the yep. this is number one okay I prefer and number the two layout of the first one yeah I, I like the you said one. just First in one? terms of background, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah the background. I like the mangrove background. The, the purple box is what, if if you got rid of the purple box and just had the mangroves, that would look a lot better. Mm -hmm. Maybe with white you wouldn't be able to read, wouldn't it. Able to read it though. Well, change yeah, with the text. With white text, or again, if that background was just a little bit more muted, yeah. and yeah. you had a very bold just have white text. Text, yeah. yeah. Might be able to read it. I think we've got. Okay, some I think you guys have got enough direction then. I like this. Yeah, excellent. I think it, I think it looks great. 
Mm-hmm. All right. Excited to see the final product. Mm-hmm. Thank you, guys. Um, all right, so the next item is reviewing the final draft of the survey for public engagement. Got that pulled up, Robin, or yeah. do we? Do you want me to pull it up? Do we need it pulled up? Yes, please. It's cold in here. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you would scroll down, Robin, to question number two. I would remove the word global in front of temperature. I think it just confuse, I think it'll just confuse people. And the ones that it doesn't confuse will say, well, that doesn't pertain to me, it's global, you know, I don't want I don't care. Mm-hmm. Are there any additional comments on this question or a following question? Not on that question, but um, I have a suggestion at the very top. Um, It just says the ability to maintain. um, I think we may want to say sustainability is the ability to maintain. It's just sort of Mm -hmm. there floating in there. Sure. And I might put the link right under the title rather than drop down where it is. So you want to define the first sentence by saying sustainability means or is, I take it that's what it's maintain. trying to do, but I don't, Makes you know, sense. I don't know why it's there. Makes it's sense, yep. I keep getting kicked offline. Is anybody else having that issue? Okay. Well, there was something else. Um, password if you want. <laughs> I have the password. I'm in. I'll, I'll like, wow. it pulls up a document and then it's, and then it's now telling me I can't open it. I'm offline. Mm. So I don't. Uh. Okay, now I'm back. I'm back. Just kidding. Oh, I remember. On number four, um, I don't, they're not numbered, but one of them says smart growth. And then it gives that. What's the difference between smart growth and environmentally friendly and resource efficient development? So that one, environmentally friendly is the second from the bottom. And smart growth is six down. Do you think it's redundant? Yeah. Unless there's some distinction that's being made that mm. I'm not getting. Looks like smart growth might also have like a social component to it. I, I see if I, I agree with Taylor. I think I, when I read development, I think of buildings, new buildings. And when I, yeah, when, and, and the other one refers to is more, glo- <laughs> it, yeah, well, is more, more, more things. Okay. Now that may not be true, but that's the way it reads to me. Yeah, I didn't see the distinction, but. Could maybe change environmentally friendly and resource efficient structures or building or architecture? 
because under smart growth, it says, for example, development. The way that I understand smart growth is like it's a plan of building uh, d development where you've got like a smart plan, you've got mixed use, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Environmentally friendly and resource efficient development to me means that you are being more conscious of the environment right. as you're building. So That's you're not building correct. on wetlands or you're, and you're building with uh, green products. So when you're building your buildings, to me, they're that? two different things. Can we say that in a way that's clearer? Smart growth is, is exactly as Dory said, which where you have more uh, density towards your urban core. Hmm. It, it's transect zones that, that I are all, yeah. So maybe we could change that mm -hmm. so, or people, so that people understand like smart growth is, uh, what's another, how can we clarify that? Well, it says it, development that balances the needs of, well, does it have to say economic development twice? Balances the need of economics and jobs, strong neighborhoods, maybe just take out that second development, that'd probably work. Economics and jobs, strong neighborhoods, healthy communities, and natural areas. Or just remove the uh, first development that and say balancing the needs of economic development and jobs, strong that neighborhoods, would, yeah, and yeah, healthy communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think we need to remove the um, and healthy communities and natural areas. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think you just need a, a comma. That first and needs to go with it, just a comma. Yes. Healthy right. communities, correct. Grammar policer here. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier to read. It, it, it does, yeah. yeah. But I agree, I don't think we need the first development in there. Right. Or that, just e.g., balancing the needs of economic development and jobs, strong neighborhoods, healthy communities, and natural areas. Yes. Yes. Comedy, a comma after healthy communities. Yes. All right, and then, I mean, I, I like the length. I like that it's mm -hmm. pretty compact. Yeah. Um, I like the way that we've added in a section where, for number seven, this is what they're currently doing, this is what they would like to do more of, so that mm -hmm. people don't feel like conflicted about answering, like, well, I already do that. So um, I think that, I think we've done a pretty decent job of trying to understand where folks are and um, how we can take this data and use it to to guide the planes more. I, I also, um, question 15, I think, um, sorry, because I jumped, so if there was anything in between there. Um, you could almost shorten that last one with just, is there a topic you feel is related to sustainability or important for sustainability which has not been included in these survey topics? Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, is there something important we're missing? Because we're really hoping we're getting right. all the important stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we know there's more important stuff out there, so I almost feel like that first part could just be gone and yeah. use what's in the parentheses as the entire mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there a topic would, you feel? That would clean it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. All right, are we, are we good with the survey? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there an easy way to link to the, um, as I was reading through and it says, please drop a pin. Is there an easy way to do that when you're actually taking the survey? Yes, there's a function to embed a map in Connect Tarpon. Okay. So that's what we'll do for that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, Next thing is on our agenda is an update on public engagement. So Robin, can you give us a timeline and where we're headed and what that is looking like, please? Sure, happy to. Uh, we're working on the video now. We are filming it tomorrow, which is great. Good. Um, yes, <laughs> and after tonight's meeting, we'll have the consensus on the survey and the flyers and logo. We can move on to try to get that logo approved. Um, the intention is to post the survey next week on Connect Tarpon and start getting the word out. Um, the video should be done next week and posted, and it will advertise these upcoming efforts that we're planning to do. 
Uh, planning the workshops is underway. The dates are not yet solidified or the locations. Right now we're just trying to determine the best days and times and things that we can offer to try to get more community members involved. But those will likely take place in April and May. Um, I'm not sure if you remember Thomas Rupert um, from UFC Grant. He is still intending to do his four listening sessions and um, the intention is for me to attend those meetings and help out um, separate from our particular plan, but we can use the information collected to supplement our plan further. So those will be taking place most likely in April and I have to coordinate with him on the dates of our workshops. We're also trying to figure out um, volunteers for the workshops to see what kind of help we will have that will also help to determine the format and the days and times as well. But we're definitely getting started, kicking off with the video and the flyer, and we'll have the survey available and a, the library and rec center and paper as was requested by Board of Commissioners and the public. So it will be available in both paper format and online. We have ordered 100% recycled and recyclable paper. Yes. So I hope that will not be a problem. <laughs> and it will be there upon request. Um, I will also be attending public events when possible to hand out and advertise our survey, our workshops. And I'll be partnering with other departments in their events, and they will be also handing out our information. And we also plan to have a write-up in the utility bills, as discussed, in the more information section. And I'm working uh, with staff to figure out all of the channels that I can advertise these initiatives. So is there, at the town hall meeting on Tuesday, it was both in person and on Zoom. And um, we were able to do this poll while, yeah. and so I was watching it at Zoom, so I was doing it at home. And I found it, I really liked that because it allowed me to feel like I was participating while I was at home and it was engaging, so I wasn't just listening and yeah, I was actually doing something, and it was really easy to do on my phone. Um, so if we could incorporate that in our workshops, um, we could get instant feedback, because it did give instant feedback with the, um, with the graphs, um, bar graphs. So that would be, I think, a good thing to do. Yeah, I like that idea. Was it Mentimeter? Do you know? The software that they used? Uh -huh. I'm not sure of the name, but it really was good. I will say I followed up talking to staff and the city manager about that. And um, that was a very resource-intensive um, effort, I will say. But more probably importantly is the vision we have for these workshops, we talked about it in these meetings, is to have more of a small table type setup, maybe four or five tables. Each table has a couple of related goal areas. And you have conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the voting thing is great, but I think you're going to get instant feedback when you have these group discussions. And I'm picturing volunteers at each of the tables, mm -hmm. moderators, note takers. Mm -hmm. And then this group will move over to another table. So you have this rotation mm -hmm. happening. So just the ones that they're interested in. Hopefully people will be interested in all of them. But um, I think it's that's, that's the model we're going for. Mm. Okay. I do think we're going to have an opportunity to do that at some other points, but um, for now, I think that's where we're going with the workshops. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, um, are we gonna be participating in First Friday? Do you know? Yes, I'll be attending First Friday. Okay. I'm not sure the exact particular ones I'll be attending, but I'll try to attend more than one. So you'll have a table set up? Is that it? Yes, I'm still figuring that out if I'll be joining with another department with an existing table. So I am one person, so <laughs> I'm trying to partner when possible. So maybe you could come out to First Friday and mm -hmm. stand around and try to get people to do the survey. <laughs> 
yeah, if you have any interest in helping with some of these initiatives, please reach out. Sure. That would be excellent, especially for our workshops. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Will, will you guys let us know um, how we're able to participate without violating sunshine laws? Because we talked about that about first Friday, that two of us can't necessarily man a booth. So um, can we just be respect that part of it as we look for moving forward? Okay. Yeah, I think Robin could help with scheduling where maybe there's shifts. Each person comes for an hour or something, and just I think as long as you're not both sitting at the table at the same time. Okay. Is it possible to announce that we are going to have different multiple members of the Sustainability Committee at First Friday, and that becomes an official meeting? And therefore, you're not breaking sunshine laws. Hmm. As long as you give the, the public two weeks' notice... You're fine. We can certainly look into that. That's a good idea. All right. Any other questions about public engagement and how that's going? Mm -hmm. Timeline? I'm excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good work. All right. Okay. So next on our agenda is a presentation on the Whitcomb Bayou Project. So thank you, Robin. Hello. The name of the app was Poll Everywhere. That's what they used. Poll Everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you were curious. Thank you. So I'm Bob Robertson. I'm Project Administration Department Director, and I'm just going to introduce our presenters today. They're going to talk to you about the, the Whitcomb Bayou Technical Feasibility Assessment. Um, for those watching on the video or recording, let me just give a quick summary and update how we got here. The Board of Commissioners back in August asked or, or uh, authorized staff to hire Arcadis through our engineer of record contract with Cardno. Um, and that was that task was to prepare this technical feasibility analysis as a draft that you have that you've seen. Um, this step is essentially a planning phase, which ultimately presents three alternatives. We actually have four um, in this draft analysis for, pu for public input and to narrow that selection down to a single project based on, of course, the Board of Commissioners, Sustainability Committee, and public input. Uh, scope of work also includes review and recommendation of funding strategies and opportunities based on the selected alternative. That just basically means matching up the right grant with the selected uh, alternative that we wind up with. So uh, our experts are here. I'll let them introduce themselves, and, and we'll go ahead and get started. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Aaron Ducaster. I'm an environmental scientist for Arcadis, and my colleague, Paul Walansky, a principal water engineer, and we're going to present the shoreline protection options to you guys today. So I'm going to warm up uh, to the uh, protection uh, adaptation, so I'm going to uh, tell a little bit of story of why uh, this project is, is ongoing. If you could go to the next slide. So you'll actually scroll down if this is a PDF. Oh. Oh, I see. So just uh, click the arrow down or scroll down, click on the screen. And oh, there we go. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, gave a sneak peek. <laughs> That's okay. We'll get to it. So some of you might be familiar with the chart on the left. This is a NOAA tide station of clear water, and it's uh, displaying the frequency of high tide flooding days, and some of you might note this as uh, t uh, flooding that's occurring from high tides on sunny days, so not rainfall-induced, not storm-induced, uh, in particular to our study site and intersection at South Spring, uh, let's see, Wickham Boulevard, Martin Luther, and I think Pineapple Street there, uh, is a very relatively low elevated spot and has flooded in the past on sunny days. I think there have been uh, some images of cars uh, rolling through salt water. And this is not just a story for the west coast of Florida, but all over the Gulf of Mexico actually had a record number of these high tide flooding days. Um, cumulative, you can see Clearwater, which is the closest station to the Whitcomb Bayou, had their record in 2019, I think 2016 up there as well. So you can flip to, or I guess I could Is go. it significant that it's getting lower? 
So in 2021, there weren't very many incidents of it? Um, so and you might see natural variations in any kind. I'd love to take that question after, actually, okay. if I can. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, and any other questions I'll take after the presentation. I'd be glad to take as many um, as possible. I'll remember yours for sure. Um, so currently around the bayou, there are two projects put in place, uh, a revetment and a buried sea wall, as well as a existing living shoreline of the mangroves, as you can see from this aerial photograph. Now, all three of these structures kind of include the mangroves in with that, do stabilize the shoreline in place, but if you do start to fill up the Whitcomb Bayou with water, that water is just going to pass right through all three of these structures and you know, go on its way into the residential areas. And so we're, I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but we're going to present actual uh, coastal structures that should divert water out of the way. And now a big reason for this project, I'm going to refer you actually to the image on the right and then back to the left afterwards, but the image on the right, everything in orange uh, around the Whitcomb Bayou is going to be under a special flood hazard area, meaning at least a minimum of a 1% chance of floods affecting that area each year. Uh, and as you get closer to the water, lower in elevation, you might uh, have a little bit of a higher chance of that. Uh, and I'm going to show that inside that special flood hazard area, I'm going to be showing a more detailed look at the elevation on the left. Now, what's important here are areas in yellow and orange and um, places that I've circled, because if we were to put a, a project around the Whitcomb Bayou uh, and divert waters out of that area, we do have low lying, uh, low elevated areas adjacent to the bayou, such as to the north, northwest, and the canal feeding into the bayou that could potentially take on that additional water that's not flooding over the bayou anymore and potentially cause flooding in another area. And so um, that is another discussion point we want to bring up and possibly uh, with the implementation of a project around the bayou may want to be supported by other ordinances that help build up seawall or protection in areas adjacent to that bayou as well. Um, and that can be, I think we can spin that into kind of a, a total sustainability plan for Tarpon Springs, whereas the Wickham Bayou is kind of a piece of that story as well. Um, so we do want to make note of, of those low-lying elevated areas um, for sure. So within that special flood hazard area, so I'm still showing the same areas, we, uh, the flood insurance study funded by, by FEMA for this region conducted a hydro hydrological study that looked at the, um, the annual chances of floods and what elevation they can come to. So this is called a return period. So 10% chance of flood every year is going to be uh, affecting everywhere in the red, uh, up to uh, 25 there is in the uh, orange, 50-year uh, um, is in the yellow, and 100-year in green, um, stretching to that total area. So what can you uh, take from this is that there's a 10% chance of flooding that affects a large swath of this area. So even a low-level uh, protection solution will bring a lot of benefits to the area. And like we said, uh, even the lowest level of protection at the 10-year will still divert waters to other areas. So we want to keep that in, in mind. Another thing we want to keep in mind for this project is sea level rise. So typically the project use life uh, maybe for uh, coastal structures might be about 50 years and might range for about 35 to 100. And so we want to look at what sea level rise is going to be for that, uh, that time period. If we get towards the end of the project and we do have sea level rise, we don't want to kind of eliminate some of the benefits that we built from the project at the beginning. And so we're kind of looking between uh, about a two to four foot uh, sea level rise between about 2070 to the end of the century there, approximately. Um, and so we are looking to have protection up to that 50 year level, to that 8.5 we're thinking. Um, but of course, uh, we're gonna take a look at that, uh, get a little bit of feedback from the city, because one thing that we have heard are concerns from the residents around the bayou about building up protection. You can think about an eight foot no, something that's eight foot tall, that's, that's taller than everybody in the room, I think. Um, and, uh, and so you're not going to be able to see beyond that. Uh, so that is a major concern of, of residents in that uh, area. You can think of like a T-wall, a uh, concrete wall blocking um, everybody's view. 
But we do want to emphasize the fact that we want to maybe have a little bit more protection than the minimum because of sea level rise uh, over time. Now, before I hand it off to Paul, I do want to touch on uh, a little bit about green infrastructure versus gray. Maybe you've heard of living shorelines versus coastal structures. Now, I'm going to, uh, if you remember back from the one of the first slides, I was talking about the existing projects there and how the mangroves are mm -hmm. known as a, a living shoreline, uh, the revetment there in a buried seawall, um, kind of not doing too much when it's, when it's buried in there. Um, but a lot of those green infrastructures or living shorelines are great, but they're also going to allow the floodwaters to pass through there. Whereas gray solutions, some of the concrete I mean, coastal structures, um, we'll get to some of the solutions here in a second, uh, will actually divert the water away from where you're trying to protect. So the houses behind any kind of solution will be protected by actual hard or coastal structure there. Um, but we do, as a part of this, we want to recognize that we don't want to impact the mangroves that are currently existing on site because they do bring benefits. They do keep the shoreline in place. They do have uh, a lot of uh, benefits for habitat and they will be complementing any kind of hard structure. Um, so we don't want to just discount them out or cause any kind of uh, damage to them in the construction of a project, right? So we do want to either find a way to keep them in place so that they help supplement the project or add living structures back in in order to supplement the hard structure that uh, we are proposing or that is proposed. So now I'm, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Paul Olansky to go over. Do you want to have questions now since you're passing uh, it on, or do you want to wait till both of you finish? I think they had intended to get through the whole presentation first. Um, I would suggest that because then you can hear the full story. That's true. He's going to give you, uh, I'll go through, run through the alternatives, and then we can wrap that back into some of the questions about what I was going through, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aaron. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we're, we're going to go through uh, some of the uh, alternatives that we could come up with uh, for flood uh, protection mitigation. Um, we're going to look at a, um, a concrete T wall, a elevated row option, a uh, multi-purpose uh, walkway or berm, and then a hybrid solution that uh, between the elevated uh, road, I mean, multi-purpose walkway and berm and the T wall. See, let's show the. Uh, this is so. This is flood protection alternative number one. It's um, it's a concrete T wall, and um, that would be placed all, all around the uh, the right of way from the between the road and um, and Wickham Bayou, and um, the concrete T wall. Would have, there would have to be an area that would be excavated to inst install the wall, um, but we think that it, this it would minimize impacts the most. I think to to mangroves um, in, in, that are currently in place, but. Um, the T wall, uh, you, know, you you could also install additional uh, vegetation on the on the uh, value side of the of the wall. In addition, it could be um, also um, like oyster beds. You could also install to uh, reduce wave action as well. But the um, the T wall uh, would also allow any existing utilities um, that from the road drainage to continue to go through the T wall. That could be that could be could be placed. Um, one other advantage of the T wall is that during, say, during a storm event, um, say uh, any vessels, boats got to loose, um, the T wall could be designed to withstand vessel impacts. Uh, so the, the uh, boats uh, smashing up against the, the bayou uh, T wall would be, would be it would be able to resist it. Um, some of the uh, disadvantages, um, as Aaron was saying, that the uh, aesthetics are very important to the residents there. Um, Having the a concrete wall to look at might not be that not very aesthetically pleasing. Uh, there is an opportunity also to plant, do some plantings on the uh, land on the roadside of the T wall to help block the, uh, I guess, the visual aspects of the T wall. Um, but um, that, uh, and then um, the, the photo on the bottom w is a um, view from the uh, approximate view from the roadside of what it might look like the road, and then. Um, there's uh, several uh, docks around the bayou, so there would have to be a watertight gate that would be, be allowed to be to, to allow access to those docks, but also to uh, be closed. And um, they would they would always be um, closed on their on their own, so that the system would always be in place uh, for flood protection. 
but that we have to allow access to those docks that are currently in place there. Mm -hmm. So that's option alternative one. Skipped one. Then alternative two that we came up with was actually uh, raising the existing roadway around uh, with, with Combayo, so no wall, so you get, so you build up the road and then slope back, slope the road, uh, the um, right away down back to the existing existing ground. Um, you probably would minimize impacts to the uh, mangrove is the, the most uh, with the solution, uh, but um, raising the road, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, arterial roads that come into the main roads around with Combayo, so those would all have to be, um, I guess, re regraded to tie into that uh, that higher road. And also, any, anyone who has any kind of any residences that have any driveways that go onto the uh, with Combayo Road that would also have to be, um, re, uh, I guess, re, um, uh, to reconnected to the road so that it appropriately uh, sloped appropriately to, from the road to their residences. The um, and then also there's the this this uh, would. Um, also, the road access during construction would, might could be an issue also because the, uh, the, the probably during construction they probably would have to do um, it's, it's a very busy road as everybody knows, and um, you know access to the road would be would be minimized during construction. You know certain sections would have to be done at a time, and then one way track traffic back and forth. So that's uh, it would be something to consider with this option the the, uh, the impacts during construction to the to the traffic flow. And alternative three, we came up with a um, an earthen berm that would be placed in the, between in the, in the right of way between the road and the mangroves, and um, the earth, earthen, earthen berm would be more aesthetically pleasing than, than a roadway. Um, it uh, it could it could have a walkway on top of it if, if desired. That wouldn't be a requirement for flood protection, but uh, it could be a benefit that's offered to residents that there be an a walk, elevated pathway around the bayou with beautiful views. Um, so that, uh, that is, uh, is an option. Um, it, we also could incorporate green solutions on the um, bayou side in, into this uh, for, for marsh kind of plants or, or mangroves, additional mangro mangroves could be planted. But this, this would affect the existing mangroves because of the slope, but they, maybe they could be replanted um, closer to the, to the water line from the, at the water's edge. And um, this, there's also in this right away um, some utility poles, light poles. Um, those would have to be relocated as well with this uh, with this solution. And then um, alternative four, we um, alternative four was a hybrid solution, and we it's a, it, there's a, a way you can um, put the in, in areas you have more right away around the bayou, you could put the earthen berm. And then in areas where the right-of-way is smaller, you could put the T-wall. And uh, so you can have sections of berm that tie into T-wall and then tie it back into earthen berm. And so it could be a hybrid kind of solutions with, with both options, the berm, the earth berm, and the T-wall. The, the only thing there is you, you could not have the walkway on top because the sections where the T-wall are would block, would, would interrupt the walkway. So that walkway would not be an option for, um, for this hybrid option. And um, and, then, and this would also limit mangrove disturbance also because the, in the areas where this right away is smaller, you'd have the T wall, which takes up less room than the earthen berm. And we, 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 we came up, we had a, um, I'm not going to read you all the uh, comparison table, but this is the, the, the four different options. And um, there's several of the advantages and disadvantages that I mentioned uh, during the presentation that are listed here. And then we're going to be doing, in the next phase, uh, we're going to take, take three of these options, and we're going to be looking at cost analysis and, um, and also be cost benefit analysis, uh, and, uh, and we'll be um, coming up with conceptual pricing for the different options as well for budgeting purposes. So. And then just to give you uh, an idea of, of, the, of the project milestones, um, so in uh, January, we completed our technical feasibility assessment. Uh, this month, we're presenting to you all for the Sustainability Committee. Um, the thing in next month, uh, Board of Commissioners presentation. Then uh, in April, um, a meeting with public involvement meeting to get input from the public. Then in, in, in May, we would complete our alternatives analysis. 
Um, in June, we would develop our funding strategy uh, memorandum, and then in July, we'd have a, a Board of Co Commissioners uh, presentation again for the pursuit of the funding strategy, and that would lead us into preparing the BRIC application that uh, is due later in the, in the fall time, October, November time frame. Oh, actually, this is right there. Opens fall 2022. BRIC application opens. So that's the, the plan to get you to the point where we submit and get in, uh, in get, um, for funding this year, uh, or we get to apply for funding this year for, for funding. Oh, let me add something to mm -hmm. that real quick. Sure. Um, in June, we were also planning come, to come back to the Sustainability Committee after we've had the public involvement and more input on the alternatives. So you will get another another crack at the uh, at giving us your opinion officially um, on the project. It, it just didn't make it on the slide, but we are coming back in June. Perfect. And I think uh, with that, we wanted to ask uh, answer any questions or comments that you had. Well, Barnett. yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when we talk well, about you, living shorelines, started, oh, I'm sorry. Start. I thought you were just thanking them. Yeah, I have a just a question about whether these methods have been performance tested elsewhere, and and if the water has ever risen above, like you know, I was. The most expensive option, for instance, is raising the roadway, and, and if it ro if it, the water went over that by chance, wouldn't it uh, flood the homes and the lawns on the other side because we're not raising those areas? Right, the, the, the homes are not being raised, but uh, hmm. yeah, they would say. So right, what so have the performance tests been in other areas where this, these um, approaches have been taken? Specific examples, um, it's going to be hard off the top of my head. I know Miami has done a lot with elevating their roads in order to keep, uh, especially the, the city of Miami has been utilizing that in, in town in order to uh, create, you know, like kind of a sewer system on the side where the rainwater will or floodwaters will go into. Um, that way all the pathways and roadways can remain accessible even during, especially during these high tide flooding days when it's sunny or, or in any kind of uh, storm surge mm -hmm. as well. I know that's probably the closest example around here. Right, but, but without the residents raising their, their home mm -hmm. uh, elevations, yeah, there's nothing that, that, something that will protect them after, after the floodwaters uh, go over the wall or a road. Right. And so if that happens, how is that mitigated after it happens? Like, let's say we have a storm surge. It takes water right into their living rooms. Mm -hmm. Is there... Anything that happens as as part of that um, rest restoration, you know, removing the water that's gone over. Right. Well, I see. So trying to draw. I think that's going to be uh, a big problem. In uh, like we want to have emphasize a level of protection that's going to make sure that. Um, so bear with me. It's going to. Uh, block out a lot of these um, flooding events, but if it topples over, I mean, it's, gonna, it's going to affect the houses, whether we have a living shoreline or a hard structure, if it makes it over. And then it's going to hit, hit the residential structures, and you're right, there's not really anything to drain it out, and that's, um, I don't think there's anything in place to kind of leave. Right, I mean, you know, floodwaters would have to recede in order for the water, the existing drainage systems to work and, and drain back out to the bayou. Um, the city could have them plan emergency pumping, potentially, um, but um, you're right there. Once it exceeds the, uh, the flood protection, then the, the homes will be Water hurt. is trapped. That's right. Right. Yeah, okay. No, That's it wouldn't be trapped. It would drain out through the storm system and then do a series of check valves to prevent uh -huh. tidal flooding back underneath the um, okay. through the storm system. So it, it wouldn't be trapped. It would only be trapped if it, if it was a major flood event mm -hmm. where everything was uh, where the water elevation exceeded the height of the walls anyway. Right. I, I see. Okay. So as a part of our design, we plan to put in the measures to keep the. So let's say we put a T wall around. Um, I'm sorry, I missed on that. Um, we're not planning to just put the T wall so it traps the existing drainage. We are going to put in the uh, necessary pump valves to mm. be able to get the water through. Okay. But I misunderstood that question. Sorry about that. Yeah. So we will, there's an existing drainage in around the bayou and that we plan to maintain that with all three or four of our uh, alternatives. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have three check valves along Dota Canese. One of them has never worked. Do we know why? Yes. Is it fixed now? Yes. And how long did it take to get fixed? Too long. 
We had, we had a uh, manufacturing defect in that one. Mm. So you put, you elevate the, the, the road to continue Denise's question, and you have a, a storm um, that dumps a lot of water, say in June, which is what happens here. Um, do the check valves get rid of that storm water? Once the tide recedes below the elevation of the storm water. Right. Does the elevated road make, and I think this was the point of her question, make the water last longer on the resident side of the elevated road. That was my question. Mm. I mean, I think the drainage system will work the same. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'd be nominal, the, the difference in time for drainage. All right. Mm -hmm. When we talk about living shorelines, we don't usually talk about just one element. Most living shorelines are multi-elements. They are at least a breakwater, composed typically of bags of oyster shells plus Spartina alterniflora, which is smooth cord grass, as I'm sure you know. And sometimes you talk about three elements, um, the breakwater, which can be oyster shells, can be granite boulders, uh, plus Spartiva or something like that that accretes and actually grows upward over time, and mangroves. So the mangroves could be part of, but not the only solution that you would call a living shoreline. Right. Um, in your slide, where you compared green and gray solutions, it specifically says green solutions attenuate wave energy and stabilize the soil. And it also says longer lasting solutions, more aesthetic, and habitat creation. So this conversation that led to your presentation tonight has been going on for several years. Right. And you may know or you may not know that I'm the reason you're here. Um, I began the conversation with your former employee, uh, Dr. Bolter, three years ago plus. Okay. And at every step of the way, we have talked about living shorelines being a part of this solution, whatever we decide the final solution would be. The mangroves are not complete. If we want to preserve those mangroves and actually improve their function, then we're gonna need a more component living shoreline. We're gonna need probably bags of oyster shells as a breakwater, mm -hmm. plus Spartiva, or Spartina, excuse me, plus the mangroves that exist. That will improve the health of the, of the mangroves. It will, in, it, it will enhance their life. It will also attenuate wave energy, which the gray solution doesn't do. The gray solution, as you know, reflects waves right. and causes damage to adjacent structures, and the gray solution, whatever it ends up being, would last longer. So I would urge you, and, and I think the Board of Commissioners will expect you, to include a more thorough explanation or, or a composite uh, living shoreline as part of whatever you come up with. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Yeah, we're probably, uh, all solutions that we propose will have, will have a living shoreline uh, feature with part of it. And apparently Florida likes paying for this because the three cities in, uh, in Pinellas County just got state grants for living shorelines. Right. Um, Treasure Island got one and a half million. Gulfport got, I forget, 300,000. And uh, correct my pronunciation, Philippi Park got 200,000 in state money for living shorelines. So it, it's a popular thing right now. And, and I think if state money could be obtained for this, that might be part of the offset for whatever brick or other grant we ultimately get. And the other, the, just one more thing, uh, as, as Dr. Bolter pointed out when she talked to the Board of Commissioners, if you incorporate the green stuff of a living shoreline in your brick grant, you get more points, you get more brownie points. So I hope I didn't make it sound as if I didn't want to go after the green living shorelines. I want to, um, I did want to make the point that they do supplement any kind of hard structure. So like, we don't want to just put it, we are, I want to emphasize that green infrastructure, it may not, you know, build up with sea level rise or match, you know, build up in time to match one of these storms, so it may let the floodwaters through. But I wouldn't suggest just going with a coastal structure by itself because it could lead to eros erosion problems around it. You think about putting in a T-wall by itself. You do have water that topples over it. Uh, I think this has been a case in a few places. It's, it's been, uh, that, that ground has just been destabilized and taken out the seawall. And we're losing trees. 
Right. So we do big wanna, old trees. I want to emphasize that even though we want to bring in a coastal structure in order to keep the residents from flooding up to a certain level of protection and then incorporate the green infrastructure to make the projects much better, much more effective. Um, and have a stronger chance of being funded by pretty much. Well, I think you did a very good job of saying we want to protect those mangroves. Mm -hmm. right. And I think we're on the same page saying we can, make them, we can even make them better. Exactly. We can make them stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the T-wall and the composite thing, um, I live on a different bayou. I live on Kramer Bayou, my wife and I do. And at, we're, we're on a peninsula with the river on one side and the flats and the Kramer Bayou on the other side, on the south side. Of the dozen or so houses between us and the tip of the peninsula, 30% of them at any given time, there's nobody home. They're either in Wisconsin or, or New England or North Carolina, mm -hmm. or they're renters who don't necessarily pay as much attention uh, to what's going on locally, or they're people who live part of the time in other places uh, around town. Uh, if the gates on the T-wall or the, or the hybrid solution require people to close them. And I think you indicated there might be a way to, to get around that. But if they, it, that, and, and then I think human nature says, that's maybe not going to work as often as we'd like it to. Right, because if you rely on the, on the residents to do it, then you, right, then you have a break in your system. And you, it's not always protecting you, or someone has to go out there before every storm and make sure they're closed. But there's probably a way to have them self-closing so that they always close behind the people. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's what I would recommend for sure. And do not prop open signs. But, um, <laughs> right, well, I guess if you put a, a brick there, I guess it's hard to, uh, um, to close, right? So, when you mentioned like the aesthetic with the T wall, the our art committee just kind of popped into my head. It's like we could probably do some sort of art exhibit with that or like paint it, make it look pretty. Um, but also with this slide, I kind of noticed so we'll, we build up around the bayou, but then are people's seawalls tall enough to, are they gonna have to heighten those themselves or? And that's a, a point that, uh, if I could bring you back to the elevation page real quick. Um, and that's kind of actually why I stuck that on right. there at the end, actually to kind of bring that up. Uh, and that is one area of concern that we have. I know this might be kind of hard to read, but what I have written here is two to three foot uh, elevation along the seawall. Right, so that's only two to three feet uh, that it'll take. That's not much water if it's if we build protection around the bayou and that water has to go somewhere, or it could be trapped within that canal that could reach up to the right. uh, two to three feet. I think on the southern side here, I had that at about four to five feet, and not only that, but behind this the southern channel here uh, could introduce flooding on the back end here that could affect the road right. as well if we want to do a, a road elevation. Right, and, th and that's significant of what elevation we could propose because we can we can want to build a wall up to a 100-year flood elevation, but if the, if this, if the water's going to come up behind the seawall up and through those those canals and come over the seawalls, the water will flood behind the seawall, and so it doesn't matter how high your wall is, that you'll, it'll circumvent the, the, the protection. So with it, without uh, an ordinance or something to uh, tell ask residents to raise their the protection of their seawalls, right? There's only a certain level of, of of protection you can get from a wall or a road or a berm around the bayou. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. Um, I have a question on all these alternatives. Mm -hmm. On the one of raising the road, so it seems from what you've said, it would be imperative that the residents raise their driveways and so on. And will that be an expense for the homeowner that they would have to pay for everything being raised? So that will be, um, if, if funded, that will be calculated into our project costs um, as a displacement. Um, if, they, if they were to not be able to access the road uh, we will actually place that into the project costs for that as a part of construction costs plus displacement of people and maybe lack of uh, accessibility to transportation being the main road. Uh, we noticed that it was very busy that day we were out there for a site visit. Mm -hmm. um, so we would incorporate those costs. So you would pay each, each homeowner to raise their driveways and their S yards? So we wouldn't be paying the oh, homeowner. Right. It would be funded through FEMA. Okay, so but you would do that work, or FEMA would project. do that work. Yes, that would be a part of the application. So they would not 
and and would it affect the sewer system as well? If, so all of yeah. that would have to be. And that, that's why it's probably one of the more costly alternatives because of all and that. And what's an estimate budget for this? So, so we haven't come up with our conceptual budgets yet. That's actually in the next phase like of the project. Like hundred million dollars or something. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a lot of money to me. We, we just, we, in our alternative slide, we just kind of uh, put what we thought relatively from one option to another, but we, we haven't come up with cost estimates mm -hmm. yet. That's in the next phase. So with the barrier, the T barrier, looks like a Jersey barrier on, mm -hmm. the, on the highway. Yep. Um, you mentioned something like it could be eight feet tall. So... One of the, and I get that it could stop the floodwaters, but one of the reasons people live there is so they can see the water. Sure. And so if they put the barrier up, how would that affect their property costs? That is a major concern. Um, we are limited in the solutions because of that small space, and we don't, and trying to find ways not to mitigate the uh, mangroves is part of why we want to put that two wall in, but that is a major concern of the residents. Um, anything that you know, we want to bring uh, the level of protection to something that's going to be effective for this area. Um, but I think that's something that uh, is a big discussion point. Right. And I don't, I don't, I'll add to that. I don't mean to sound glib, but I mean uh, the property value for a home that floods all the time. I got it. It's an offset issue. I, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. Yeah. But I, yeah. But it may not flood all the time. Right. Sure. Right. So, so, so with, a, with a wall around the bio, their flood insurance might be lowered, but uh, that might not, they might not care as much. much. <laughs> so One I point I'd like to make, oh. if I could, mm -hmm. related to your question. So the top of that wall, that's given in terms of elevation. Mm -hmm. right. So if the elevation of that road is about three feet, that particular example, that wall is about three feet high, even right. though it says right. 5.8. I, I see. Right. So it's still going to be high. Right. Though. Right, and that's at the at the ten year and flood protection. Unless it's lower than the elevation of the mangroves. Plant. Right, at, at the moment, right, it would be lower than the, the height of the mangroves, and that ten year flood protection. Um, okay, that's good exactly. to know. That, I had that Next. clarification question as well. So it seemed like it was about two feet eight inches above the existing. Two point eight feet. Yeah. Yes. Two point eight feet. Right. Yeah, almost so the <laughs> 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 that'd be a cheap one. Two point eight feet. Yes. So on alternative three, hmm? um, this idea of putting a sidewalk or something on top. Yeah, that, that's that looks sort of dangerous. That you could fall off, and if you had a bicycle and you had children riding their bicycles on it or something, have you explored the safety of that? And that's where we wanted to add maybe a, a safety railing that right. uh, is kind of a little bit uh, off-centered there, um, but we could uh, have the options of safety railings. And with that, instead of maybe, uh, you know, having kind of sectioned uh, you know, columns so that you can see through right. um, so that it's not blocking even more of residents' views right. if we're stacking that on top of a, a already uh, elevated berm there. Plus, you have issues of being trapped if you have walls and safety of if someone were to come after you. That's a big issue. Um, well, yeah, you're, I mean, you're right. There could, could be railings on the sides for to keep yeah. people from uh, falling off. It would be a five-foot walkway. So, Can I ask a question about, can we go back to the, the whole Different outline of the bayou mm -hmm. and show us exactly where mm -hmm. it starts and ends? Yes. I, I'm not understanding how the magnitude of what we're talking about. There's here. some there's some area there that has riprap on it already, right? And and so that's yeah. So that's following right. the yep. the current projects in place right here mm -hmm. are along the shoreline, eastern shoreline, down to about here is the revetment riprap, and then buried seawall carries to about if you're following my mouse to about there. Hmm. And there's more riprap to the south. And right. there's a little bit more. Yeah, that's right. Would you say that so, again, please? So revetment and riprap, if you're following my mouse, starting from uh, the northeast corner here, mm -hmm. somewhere around here, it, it trails a shoreline to about here, and then the buried seawall gets carried to uh, about this it's canal actually, right here. It's from Craig Park. Right. And so, oh, it is from So it's here. just yeah, it's, it's just that it's portion of Whitcomb Craig, Bayou? Craig Park to the, to the, the bridge, right? Yeah, east and then south, maybe a little bit up here north. 
I think those right. stretches all the way up here. And the one thing to note is that several of these options would require that to be re actually removed to, to install the T-wall or, I mean, unless, unless the T-wall could ins be installed behind it in some areas. I mean, we, try to, we, we would try to uh, keep as much as we could, but it, in some cases, with the right-of-way being very small, especially on that eastern shoreline, that riprap might have to be removed to implement, implement these options. Has anybody talked about using the riprap, using those granite boulders, and moving them out into the water and using them as your breakwater? We've discussed that for the mangroves a little bit, but I think that same application can go for the, mm. the riprap as well. Right, so they, they could be re so reused. I think, I think that is a good idea. Uh, something, I think we had a little picture of that on, I can point you towards the elevator road. It's something like if we're, uh, sorry, I did that with the pathway. Since the pathway would have major impacts on the mangroves, they would require either uh, to be taken out or to be removed or to be relocated which is a better option right sure. um so we're kind of extending the shoreline out and that's you know we could uh do a system with either the uh revetment riprap or uh, use a living shoreline or a conjunction of both yeah the, i mean you're not going to be able to put in an, an, an elevated walkway where there is riprap you the riprap's going to have to go in one direction or the other so why not use it you know sure right. that's um, a good point at least it could be repurposed. Just to then. clarify, this the picture where the bayou is right there, that is not going to be in the plan. Is that correct? Because that house is much further. That yeah. boathouse? Well, that, that, is that building is. The building is that this, along the south shore? picture was taken yeah. on the I think side. you're right, yeah. Okay, so, but the project is not going over. That, that's why I was getting confused, because I, I know where that house is, and I'm yeah. like, that's not where that... Yeah. What we're talking My about. Apologies, I just had a good side. No, view yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, I just that's where I was getting hung up. I think. So if there is a wall, the T wall, how do people get to their docks, and how do people access the bayou, which lots of people use? Mm -hmm. right. I mean, so there has to be lots of openings. Right. Well, the picture on the bottom would show there would be an opening at at, at every dock uh, structure, so that residents can go across the street and and access their dock. Um, and how about just public access? I mean, there wouldn't be locks on those those gates so that public could open them also and, and get behind. And I guess they'd be walking between, I'm not sure how much room there would be between the T-wall and the and, the, and, if, and if any grasses and the rand grows. Uh, you might, there might not be much room to walk behind the wall there. I think, yeah, I think it's going to have an impact on, I think we've heard you know, people like to stop and fish mm -hmm. uh, there, and so it could have a, a little bit of an impact for... Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But there isn't a sidewalk on the bayou side. They're only on the, only on the, across the, the uh, roadway there is a sidewalk on the roadside. So, but yeah, people wouldn't be able to walk. Um, they, 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 there would be a short area between the wall and the road, a uh, very short, sh small shoulder there for a few feet, so it might not be that safe to... Uh, to walk along there between the road and the, and the, and the T-wall. So every one of these efforts will run that length that you currently show, that you showed us in that picture. So if it was a, if it was a T-wall, it would run the length from where it starts at Craig Park with the, um, the current mitigation or, uh, procedures all the way around through where you showed us the end. So w whether it's raising the road, whether it's putting a T-wall, would all of these follow that same length? I think it would be even further. I mean, all, all around the, the Whitcomb Bayou. All around Whitcomb Bayou. So it would so, be where that house is. So, so my question um, then goes to water has to go somewhere. And I've got two, two comments on that. If by raising the road, um, elevating the road, you, you would have to grade the driveways then to match that, which then puts, with right. all that water, the water actually has a greater chance if, of going into people's homes right. yeah. than being level and flush with the road. So that, mm -hmm. I, I was kind of piggybacking on where you yeah. guys were because all of a sudden, I, I'm not an engineer, so if, if my comments or what have you are, are ignorant, that's where that comes from because that's not, but I would envision that if there's water, mm -hmm. that's here, right, and it's being absorbed in the grass. It stinks to have the, your front yard underwater, but it stinks Especially worse when water. everything's right. going, going at a slope, regardless of the grade. Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, because water has to go somewhere, if, you put, if you're putting a T-wall around that, goes back to where um, Dr. Robinson's question was with the, the um, everybody raising their seawalls, et cetera, um, that also becomes a problem. Right, right now, the walkway around Craig Park, so around Spring Bayou, mm -hmm. on a king tide or a high tide, 
sluts mm -hmm. and you, you know, it's ankle deep. I've walked it. It's ankle, ankle deep. And, um, I mean, I have a personal, personal interest in that water not rising. Um, but it does become an issue with now you've taken this great opportunity to fix one area, but actually create can be creating another problem for right. multiple homes, like the homes on Manatee, just south of that bridge at MLK, mm -hmm. where that little channel goes mm -hmm. and what that feeds mm -hmm. into. Mm -hmm. Then you've got people all along the bayou, whether it's Spring Bayou or they're, I don't know, remember what they call that little area going from like Spring and Whitcomb Bayou out towards the river, but there's another little name for that little area, but you've got homes all along that way. It's Marconi or something like that. Yeah, Marconi, it is. So, so my question then becomes, how do you, how do you fix this problem right. without creating another problem five, that five years down the road that now we're going right back to the drawing board to fix that? Well, yeah. well I think right at where, uh, for the ele elevated road option, you know, right at where the, where the driveways connect to the road, yes, that the water will be draining down those driveways towards the homes. But then otherwise, I think between the, uh, the driveways, there'll be a, bit, a swell that the water, water will be collected to and, and directed towards the dra drainage. So it wouldn't all be going towards the homes. But yes, at the, dr at the driveways themselves, there's no way to keep it from running from the road down to the homes right, on right. the driveways. But um, I think the swells would try to direct it to, to the drainage uh, features. Well, where is it going to drain to? I mean, that's the issue, isn't it, that there's no way place for the water to drain. Well, you're talking about during a rain event, or you're talking about when uh, the flood, uh, flood waters came over the top of the road? Yeah, I'm just talking about high tides and all of that. I think we're, I think we're getting like, confused about the intent of this project. It's not going to be like a huge, like Hurricane Katrina with like the big, what do they call those? Levees. It's not, we're not, we're not creating a levee that's going to stop a storm surge. We're creating something that's going to stop the daily or the coastal flooding that's happening Same six time. times a year, eight times a year. I mean, the intent, if, if a hmm. storm event were that high, it wouldn't matter if there was a berm, it's going to come <laughs> into the house anyway, right? I mean, so I that, like, I think that maybe that's where we need to, at the beginning of the presentation to the Board of Commissioners, really like clarify the intent of the project is not to like prevent a major disaster from flooding homes. It's this daily yeah, inundation. Yeah. 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 And then I, I do want to go back though, because I, I, I'm still confused. Is the project <laughs> going from here and ending here? Or is it going around the bike? Like where is, where is it going? So we we're just talking about the, exi the existing structures in place go from here down to here. But we're going to push a project that goes around the entire bayou right. because of all of these areas that are prone to their low-lying elvish. You see the legend to the right, everything in orange is between the two to four feet, and everything from uh, in yellow is four to six feet. And I'm just quickly going to bring you to another slide to show that 10% annual chance of flood is right there at 5.8 feet. So almost everything in yellow, orange, and red are going to be affected, you know, 10% chance every year of, of flooding. So I'll add to that. Um, this is where we're going to need to involve the county. And we yeah. brought the Hancock person here. County Robbins made a, a good connection with um, Hank Hottie with this mm -hmm. back in Orange County. Um, if you think of Whitcomb Bayou as a clock, we've got everything from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and the county's got everything from 6 o'clock mm. back around to the top. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we need to coordinate with them closely, and they've already expressed an interest if, if, if mm. we were to expand the project in partnering with us in, in the application for a grant. And I think, I think, Robin, you told us that the county is doing a sustainability uh, study right now, I believe, yeah. mm -hmm. and but we're hoping maybe we can incorpor get incorporated into that study. Mm -hmm. So can I go back, do any of these so help mitigate like again if the water has to go somewhere so uh, that's you stop it from flooding that area right around Whitcomb Bayou and if you go all the way around you are now are you potentially having water raised around Spring Bayou and out that Marconi area like there's there's a little there are probably like six or seven houses off Innes um, that Right. that come right into Whitcomb Bayou mm -hmm. and then um, there's a couple houses like as you're heading out of the bayou underneath Beckett Bridge what have you so there's a lot of there are a lot of other mm -hmm. areas like you, you again I'm not an engineer but I, I'm envisioning you've got this area 
that where now the water is, is staying in and it's no longer coming out to the roadway and flooding the roadway, but it's staying in, it's got to be pushing. I, I, I just envision instead of the ankle deep water walking around the bayou on that day, and it's now, I'm sure, it's knee deep. I'm going to drown before the rest of you all. I'm just going to go there. <laughs> um, so do any of these take into account where that water is going to go and then what happens to Spring Bayou, the structures around Spring Bayou, or any of the homes that will have that? No, and that's why we would say that even with the minimum level of protection, that still puts the adjacent areas at risk, even with a 10-year... Because that's just yeah. creating... You're solving one problem, but it's actually creating... Yeah. A, right. It, okay, so I, I'm seeing no. So, so, Bob, yeah. Okay, so... The no. ocean as, a, as an infinite node in, in modeling terms, um, if, you, if you push water out, if you put, build a sandcastle on the ocean, and you put a, build a big moat and wall around it, you're not going to increase the water level around you because the ocean is an infinite level node. Mm -hmm. right. That's how you have to think of it. So it's not going to okay. exacerbate those problems. But what I will tell you is, when you talk about the problem on Spring Bayou at Craig Park, mm -hmm. correct? Um, what we've done, completely separate from this project, is we've started a seawall master plan pro project on that. Okay. Sure. And we've talked about that. Right. Um, and we've applied for a ten and a half million dollar state grant yeah. to um, uh, upgrade every city seawall and mm -hmm. increase mm -hmm. the elevation up of every city seawall, minimum elevation. Now that doesn't hit every seawall in the city, it barely sure. scratches the surface, but that's ten and a half million dollars to, mm. to make another cut at trying to fix mm. big problems a little bit at a time. Okay, no, thank you, I appreciate that. And the idea uh, of starting with Whitcomb Bayou really began with the Board of Commissioners, mm -hmm. uh, and specifically with the current Vice Mayor, who likes the idea of a walkway from, from Craig Park all the way to Sunset Beach. A wonderful idea. Um, of your four proposals, I think the elevated walkway, uh, the multi-purpose beam walkway, is probably going to be the most viable. But that's just my opinion from what I've heard from you know, other people, and, uh, including people on the board. Um, hmm. I, I know you've mentioned a couple of times that you expect some pushback from citizens who don't want to lose their view. And, and that's one of the reasons you've used a 10-year uh, versus a 100-year um, flood elevation. Um, have you thought about how you will present this to the citizens? and perhaps use the new uh, FEMA uh, flood insurance costs that were up, updated beginning in October of last year. Um, people may not realize it yet, but their flood costs and their, even their ability to get flood insurance uh, is dramatically changing and changing fast. Uh, and that, you know, <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, having some protection from the flood uh, could could do a lot to make their lives less expensive and their insurance less more more available and, and and less expensive. That's just one thought. Right. Yeah. I think we need to emphasize some of the things that they want to. You know, if we're coming to them with, we may block your views. We also want to say, hey, we're going to save you money. We're also going to preserve your quality of life uh, through up to this level of protection, obviously, but. We want to touch on that, that I think money is a big thing, um, and then quality of life. You know, you don't want to be disrupted by floods uh, either into your house or even on the main road around the bayou. And so function, everyday function and, and <coughs> savings of uh, flood insurance as well. Um, the combine of those two factors, are, I think, are big. Um, right. Welcome to hear anything else if you have any suggestions. Yeah, I'd, well. I'd like to piggyback on that. Um, you know, we're going through a major election. Mm -hmm. And lots of the discussion at all of the public events, a lot of it's about keeping the look of tarpon, historical preservation, and putting these walls around, even if they're not too big, is not sort of the idea that people have of what tarpon's supposed to look like. So I think that to use all the computer technology to make images, sort of to show how it could look, mm -hmm. plants in front of it, mm -hmm. you know, make it look attractive. And I think the issue about flood insurance, it's also property insurance. Mm -hmm. They've been canceling property insurance like crazy. Mm -hmm. This would help that. So 
both of those together, including what Paul has said about the natural shoreline um, solution, people would be more um, favorable to that mm -hmm. than the T walls or the elevated and having to redo their homes and, and all of those issues. But the presentation is going to be crucial. And if you show, I'm just saying this, right, the people wall. are going to freak <laughs> out and they're not going to accept it. And so the, I think it was the aesthetics. And you may want to think of um, piggybacking with the Public Art Committee yeah. and yeah. how to, and public art is also landscape. I mean, landscape art is a big deal now. But so there's ways of, of doing this to make it um, agreeable. But as it stands now, it's not agreeable, even though it might be a good thing. I think what Taylor was mentioned, but the art solutions, you know, there definitely is opportunity for, with the T-Wall for etchings of fish or something, or maybe even a mural of, of fish all around the bayou. But I think that's a great idea to involve the art committee. Um, so Paul mentioned a walkway from Spring Bayou to Sunset Beach. And then I, would, I just kind of thought like, so if we do go with the hybrid one where you've got the walkway, um, but then you have the sections that it's T-wall, maybe you do one of those boardwalks that you find it like a park. That way it's like a continuous path. Just a thought. What is the timeline on this? Because I'm thinking like Beckett Bridge, like the whole city can't be all torn up at the same time, right? <laughs> So, so the brick funding application goes in in the fall. So this would be in the fall. So this would be at least not starting until later in 2023. It's going to be 2023 now, so later in next year. Right. Well, after the funding would be, uh, in, uh, if the funding is granted, then we have to go into design mm -hmm. and then then bidding and then construction. Right. So probably not into summer to fall of 2023. Right. And yes, that pretty much lines up when Bank Road is going to be built. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you can't go like you can't go around this way. You can't go around this way. Just yeah. if, if gotta take the, your boat. If I was the king of the world, I'm <laughs> <laughs> worried they all line up and nobody got in, in, in any uh, traffic jams. I have a question about the um, alternative three, the the walkway. Um, you said that that's most disturbing to the mangroves. So what, how much mangrove loss are we talking, and how quickly can that be built back? Well, I think it, it's disturbing in the sense that the, the, the uh, berm would have to be placed where the mangroves are existing right now. But I think the, 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 um, the strategy would be to, to re, replant those mangroves uh, waterside. And so they, not that they, they would be disturbed, but they would just be re relocated. Right. right. So. It will require quite a bit of permitting. Right. For, mm -hmm. With the right, the DEP mm -hmm. is that pretty successful? Like, like, do they live when you move them? Uh, and you have to have a professional come out, and they, you know, it's it's uh, they do a pretty good job. I think they, uh, it's going to take a little bit to convince them to take on quite a big project like this uh, with mangroves surrounding the entire uh, bayou. Right. Um, might be they might take a hard look at that, and so that is a, a consideration moving forward is how. FEP will respond. Right, because if it's too much mangrove disturbance, they may not approve the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance then of what Taylor was saying of like using like s not do using like a raised walkway or something like that instead of or like more of a boardwalk or is that not kind of like feasible? I, I think that might be tough to get in the because uh, you're talking about the hybrid. Uh, yeah, for so the like hybrid. if they wanted a continuous walkway, but you can't do it over the T wall, maybe put a boardwalk. But that's what I was saying. But well, I will add to that. Um, we're talking about, I mean, he was mentioning the railings and the safety, that's mm -hmm. an important concern, but also think about this, the berm is what sets the elevation, right? So if that's at sitting at five foot eight ele elevation, approximately three feet above the, the road surface, now you got a railing that's another mm -hmm. three, yeah. four feet mm -hmm. above that. So if you didn't, if you thought the berm was ugly, wait till right. you see the railing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and if you do a boardwalk, it had the, it had the same concern. Mm -hmm. So sure. what your, your point was excellent. Um, when we do the renderings, I think we're going to have to get more realistic about that and um, really show what mm -hmm. it's going to look like. Um, I think this one is going to probably be the hardest one to do. I think yeah. Raven's Road is actually easier, if that makes any sense, because mm -hmm. not only do we have the issues we just dealt, we just discussed, but 
you've got a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permanent revetment project that we're going to have to demonstrate. We're basically going to have to start from scratch and redesign mm -hmm. that for them. Okay. And, um, yeah, and when you talked about recovering the boulders, um, that's part of that. Because now we're anytime you touch a boulder, you're touching a, a, an Army Corps project. Right. And so uh, this one is going to be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we're going to mm -hmm. have to fight that point as well. And back to my original question was just if you had any places that could give reviews mm -hmm. on the performance of this type of um, all of these different options, you yeah. know, so that there's some live feedback on the history sure. where these have been done before so it doesn't feel so experimental. And maybe some visuals of it as well. Yeah. Right. I think that's a good point. I think the, I think it's good to, good to present in our public meetings, meetings to the public and the board. Um, I know that the sea walls have been used uh, successfully in, in New Orleans a lot, and um, I'm sure there's projects in, that we can find in Florida as well. But um, and elevated roses, Florida. Um, the one that's Miami. not coming off the top of my head is an elevated pathway. Um, I'm trying to think if I remember one from Boca Raton, actually. And there's uh, plenty of but, earthen burns. But I think, right. I think that's a great idea to add in a you know, li live example of this, where it's successful, uh, what that looked like, um, and then um, you know, kind of draw that into the Whitcomb Bayou here um, mm -hmm. as well, kind of how that's mm -hmm. I would suggest that you talk to the city arborist about mangroves and um, how to replant them and how to plant new mangroves and how quickly they grow. I mean, mangroves in front of, you know, on my bio, Kramer Bayou, I mean, we get new sprouts all the time that are just driving, growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, we love mangroves. And it's important with the mangroves to also say that they're a major collector of CO2. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why mangroves are so important. So we don't, we want them. The more the merrier. Yes. Right. We're also a working waterfront and that's where all the that's the nursery for all of our yeah. golf life. You know, there's sponge, crab, sure. shrimp, fish, everything. So for our commercial and sports fishing, it's the more mangroves we have, the, the closer and people can fish as well. Sure. So there's a, a economic impact. And I think it's just a good example it shows how well the mangroves do thrive there because in the Army Corps project the mangroves are already starting to grow into the rocks mm -hmm. there. So they are spreading. And I, I've also heard that mangroves don't not only stop erosion, that they can actually rebuild shorelines. Mm -hmm. Yep, rebuild shoreline, and also uh, break waves that are coming in from yeah. from a storm. Actually, Spartiva actually does a better job than mangroves. Uh, the, than um, in terms of absorbing uh, CO2, salt marsh does oh, a better salt. job than salt anything, marsh. and uh, and uh, also helps with raising the uh, the bed upon which they they are planted over time. So we, sure. we have 13 minutes oh, left yeah, in tonight's yeah. meeting. So, um, and we still need to get to the, um, this is a lot. Reduce your campaign, reduce your use campaign. Um, so is, what is it that you need from us? Do you, is it tonight? Is it like a, a preference for one of the options or was this it that you got some feedback on? I think we would like a, a, some of the feedback on what to expect or what to bring to the presentation to the Board of Commissioners has been great. That's been some of the, how we can uh, present, them to, present these alternatives to them. Um, and that kind of feedback is, is most important. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean we, we are gonna, in the next phase, we are going to be moving forward with three of these options. Is it, is it this committee's job, though, to pick those three options, or is it the next? They, it's up to this committee. They can choose to give us that direct feedback, say we like option X better than all of them, or we can just take the individual feedback on all the alternatives and present that to the Board of Commissioners as well when we discuss each one. Yes, Board, this is what the sustainability committee thought about alternative one, alternative two, alternative three, and alternative four. Either way you want to do it is fine with us. Thank you. And just one more suggestion for the BOC is make it very easy of where this is going to start where the riprap is, where it's going to end, you know, just a, a real easy, because looking at that aerial with the different colors and everything is very confusing. Mm -hmm. right. And you might also want to mention which are the, uh, th th that are our roads and which are not our roads, where the, where oh, the between county, county roads yes. and city roads. Yes, mm -hmm. so that's that a good we idea. won't think that it's like the whole thing that this is responsible for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Or right. even an overlay. Yeah, you something know, like of that. What, just something what that makes it easy area. for yeah. people to see the scope of it. What's under our purview? What's not? Yep, I like that. Good Thank idea. You. Yep. 
Thank and you. I'd like to not weigh in on option one, two, three, or four, but just kind of collectively take what we've given you tonight. No. Um, and then if you have anything else that you think of that, you know, we, you'd like to then get that to Robin so she can get that mm -hmm. to the Arcadis team. I just have one other thing I'd like to ask, and that is I don't understand how you can do any of these four alternatives without moving the riprap in some places. So, I mean, I don't know why that would be uh, a prevention for number three and not for the others as well. I think you're going to have to move it regardless. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. So, yeah, for example, T wall may have impacts on mangroves and, and the riprap in certain areas, but a lot less than trying to put the elevated pathway in the same spot. That's going to cover more room and end up uh, causing a lot more direct impacts to those, uh, those structures, to the mangroves and uh, to the riprap. Yeah, I remember probably in the next phase of this project, when, before you go into design, you probably have to do a pre-application meeting with FDOT and Army Corps of Engineers to get their feedback on, on mm -hmm. what, we're, what you're planning to go forward with. Very good. All right. Well, then, thank you, Eric. Aaron. 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 Okay, Aaron. Aaron and Paul. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you, Bob. Thank you for all the feedback. Yes. Much thank you. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> all right, Robin. Let's talk about reduce your use campaign. Okay. So are any of you all familiar with the Reduce Your Use campaign as it is? I see Denise is, Dory is. Um, so this is an existing campaign that was created as a partnership between Hillsborough County, Pinellas County, City of Tampa, City of St. Petersburg, Keep Tampa Bay Beautiful, and Keep Pinellas Beautiful. And some of those partners have joined over time, and they're open to any city, county, or nonprofits participation as a sponsor of this program. Um, so essentially, through this campaign, individuals and businesses can take a pledge to reduce their waste production. And it requires no commitment. Um, if we were to participate in this program, we would not have a time commitment. There would be no associated cost. Nothing of that nature. All that we would do is essentially say that the city of Tarpon Springs supports this campaign. It would go on our website, and we can hand out promotional materials at events saying that we um, sponsor this initiative, or we rather we support the initiative. So basically, there's a website, Reduce Your Use, and I'll pull that up. So this here is the main page, and it directs you to take a pledge as either um, an individual or a business. And um, you can see the partners there. So individuals, this is the individual pledge, where you can just say what actions that you personally want to take to reduce your waste production. It gives some education. It gives some ideas. And it basically encourages those individuals to uh, reduce their waste in these various ways. Then they actually submit the, um, the pledge. And this gives great data tracking. And they can also track by zip code. So we can actually keep track of what residents in Tarpon Springs, if they're actually taking it, what are they saying? This provides great data. Like if they say, for instance, um, a lot of them are indicating that um, they want passing out on disposable takeout boxes and bringing their own reusable containers. Well, that's something that we can then take to the Chamber of Commerce and show them this data and then maybe do something with it. Furthermore, there is a uh, pledge for businesses. And similarly, again, um, there's no cost or any sort of, um, they don't have to report to anybody or do anything that would be obtrusive for them. 
They just say the ways that they would like to reduce their waste production. After they submit this, um, Hillsborough County then works with them, gives them promotional items, and gives them free advertising for participating in this program. Um, so it's a really great opportunity for businesses because it does provide those things, and they actually get that support to take those changes. Um, so yes, and then you can actually update your pledge if you want to in the future if, say, the business started doing additional actions. So um, the businesses do give their, their information that will then be put on the website. So if they um, start out only committing to one or two things, but then start adding in, uh, I don't know, utilize a commercial recycling program later on, then they can come here and update it and be recognized for those additional actions that they are now taking. And um, I met with Hillsborough County about this program, um, and they just confirmed there's no cost, there's no real commitment. They just would want a copy of our logo to put on the website, and they asked that we do our best to help spread the word. And I do want to point out specifically that this would fit in well with um, STAR Climate and Energy Action 3, um, education and outreach, create an education and outreach campaign to engage residents, businesses, and local government staff and their roles in achieving waste reduction targets. So this is great because it's an existing campaign with a lot of participation, a lot of advertising, and a lot of partners might be more success successful than starting our own from the ground up. So um, this is for your consideration. We already talked about this with the city manager. He um, seemed to be interested and wanted us to bring it to you all tonight to hear your thoughts. I'm seeing a lot of nods, so I'm seeing consensus I, I don't, that I don't we support it. I see a downside it. to this at all. I, I have Great. one question. So it's voluntary. So I know I lived in St. Pete when they passed the thing about the plastic straws and and that was to be mandatory at a certain point and then there's been big pushback from the state against that so this gets around it by having it all voluntary is that true uh well they don't even have to choose straws if they don't want to it, it's completely yeah it's completely voluntary for this one if i'm not sure how St. Pete <laughs> what they're doing it was about any sort of requirement to be greener. Yeah, uh, well, eliminate plastic or whatever. Yes. Um, well, this one is yeah. It's entirely voluntary for whatever the individual or the business wants to do. There's no sort of um, you don't have to prove it. <laughs> they don't check in on you to make sure you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. The state pushed back big time. I think this one is just more of one of good faith. <laughs> yeah, that you're that you're going to do the things you're you're committing to and um, that the county will be they will let you be as involved as you want to be. Uh, particularly um, Daniel Gallagher is the one who kind of runs this program with Hillsborough County. Um, he's the recycling and waste specialist and he mentioned that a restaurant in Tampa, I think it's called Cali, Sitio Cali or something like that, they're very invested in this program and they do a lot of events and that's because they want to have that level of involvement, not because you have to have that level of involvement. And there are some businesses and um, partners that are more laid back, not really involved in the events and that's fine too. Great. All right. Thank you. Sounds like we're on board. Yes. All right. That's great. Up. We're <laughs> checking off some boxes for stars. Yes, that's good. Excellent. It's <laughs> good. Very good. All right. Looks like that is the end of we did it. We got through it. Yes. Good job, <laughs> good job everybody. Um, public comments. Would you like to say anything? 
Um, <laughs> Come on up and introduce your yourself. name and address. Introduce myself. My name's Gabrielle Killerman. I recently moved here to Tarpon, so I wanted to get involved and see what was going on in the city. Um, yeah, so it sounds great. Um, one of the comments I made to the Arcadis people was that like, I thought maybe instead of raising the road and things like that, they should have just put in permeable pavement and then rain gardens. Mm -hmm. And they kind of said, you know, maybe that wouldn't be enough. So I think it'd be cool to have maybe like a public initiative for more rain gardens in your own property because that can help with flooding and things yeah. like that. So That's, yeah, good, good to meet you guys. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for coming. All right. Staff comments? None from me. Um, Dory, I know you wanted to talk about your article during committee comments. I think to do that, we would need to extend the meeting a couple minutes. Motion to extend the meeting three minutes. <laughs> talk three fast. Minutes. I will talk fast. Well, let's do five. <laughs> <laughs> let's do three. Three is good. She three can do good. it. All right. So three, uh, we'll... Okay. Second. There's a second? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I mean, I shared the article with y'all and the, the report. So NOAA's released their new report, and now they're projecting the, the two-level uh, rise in sea level by 2050. So we're talking like 30 years from now, we're looking at two feet more sea level. And they specifically mentioned that Gulf communities along the Gulf of Mexico are probably going to be impacted greater than okay. other parts of yeah. the country. So the, the conversation with Arcadis, I mean, no, it's not going to prevent a right. catastrophic event, but we, we're gonna need to get very real very quickly about, as a city, how you know we're addressing rainy day flooding on our roads. So mm -hmm. um, I would like to pass that along to the Board of Commissioners mm -hmm. for just to make them aware of the report uh, as part of just their ongoing education, if you guys are okay with that. I, yes. would, I would add a couple of things to that. Um, it, the article talked about 12 to 14 inches, and now we're saying two feet. I didn't find the two feet in that article, so when did, when did that change happen? I heard something around there on NPR this morning, so two I'm feet. sure that somewhere it's being reported. Well, I, I, I thought the 12 to 14 inches was a little low, and I think that's that's... I don't know that that's even the intermediate um, that NOAA um, publishes for, for that period of time, 2050. But I, I think it's which, whichever number, and I think two, two feet is certainly a lot more reasonable than one. Um, I think it's important to say that the high estimate, which would be three feet by 2055, uh, is based upon the assumption that we as a species will continue burning fossil fuels at the rate that we are today. Mm -hmm. And coupled with that, the fact that we ain't slowing down a bit. In spite of all the promises that countries have made, we put more millions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere in 2021 than we did in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we're actually, I mean, we had a little blip in 2020 because of the, of the beginning of, of the pandemic, but last year we just threw some more back on and, and we're not slowing down. So the, the high estimate, which is based on us not learning anything and not changing our burning of coals, may become the real estimate. So two feet may be an underestimate. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think it's important just to know what that's based on. The, the intermediate assumes that we're going to learn and change. We need a before it's too late campaign. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, any other comments? Very good, look at that. Meeting adjourned then at 8.03. 8.03. Yeah. <laughs> we did it. This was a good one. <sighs> so, No, so been there and done that. Yeah. 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 Of course. <laughs> you have to test well, negative to get back into school. Yeah. So. I know. Yeah. And you just moved here? Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Thank you.
you. Thank you. Yeah, when did you start? Um, December so 27th. Very recently. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think we get here. So, speak to somebody like an office with the DPP. Would you be able to do that? One of the guys in my office was like, Um, I live pretty close. I live in Oldsmar. Do any sort of anything with the city of Charleston Springs. I mean, the kid wasn't even sick. I like that he was a village. Bank groups are part of it. Oh, my God, absolutely. We have so much. Oh, no. Uh, ten days unless they test negative. That's great. Yeah, we have so much like public involvement coming up. Talk to them. Yeah. Do you have family here or like uh, good idea. Mask. And I was like, okay. it's a good idea to get that cleared up. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's not gonna happen. There's no way. So um yeah. So we had them tested outside of the pediatrician's office, and they both tested negative in my pack. So. Uh, do you want to give me your email? Okay. And I'll, and I'll keep you updated. I can give you mine. Carol, why? Can you push your chair in? Here we go. Yes, mother. Thank you. All right. I think I have you on Facebook, too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Have, have a great you night. Too. Yeah, just me. Yeah. <laughs> Probably it would be better to be. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Yay.